Hello and welcome to the Little Knowledge Podcast, where this time we're looking at two houses with very different fates, one fully restored and one with a controversial end. We're looking at Whitson Court, near our old stomping ground of Flanwern Park, uh, and Stelvio, a townhouse for the first time. So no aristocrats this time out, but self-made people. Now mm. I'm Paul Busby and with me as ever is the poet, tutor, broadcaster, actor, his CV goes on forever. Goff Morgan. Hello, Goff. <laughs> hello, 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 everybody. Greetings, Stu. Good Lord, uh, I sounded rather interesting then. Yeah, well, they'll, they'll find thing. out the truth in time. <laughs> 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 More impressive than my CV. I can assure you of that, Goff. How's things? Okay, bumbling along, getting on with it. That's all you can do. Occasionally all right, occasionally down in the dumps. Well, not down in the dumps, just like... Winter lethargy is like, oh, oh, I just want to stay in this bed under this duvet. Well, yeah. spring's on its way. Spring's on yeah, its way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the days are nice and long and everything's getting longer. It's, it's, uh, it'll all be better soon. Well, <laughs> now, last time out, we did the uh, did Fonmon Castle, didn't we? That was our yes, last one. Another toe into our Glamorgan pool. Yep. And uh, we may go back into Glamorgan at some point. We've got the big guns of Margam and we've got the big guns of Dunraven Castle. Yeah. So we will be back. But for today, we are concentrating on. Well, let's see if this works. That's what we've said, isn't it, Goff? Yes. It's a, a, a double header. Yeah. It's a try. Are you interested in getting away from the aristocrats and the great estates that carved out their niche in Welsh history just for a little bit of a look at townhouses and the lesser gentry houses? So we've got a double header. Each one might not hold up a full episode, but together, mm. I think they work OK. Yeah. Well, I think that's the nice thing. Because sometimes there's lots of interesting, you know, historical stories which mm. don't fill up. A whole program type thing. So we can every so often it's nice to dip your toe into a little anthology. So this is our a little two-hander. That's the word I was grasping for. That's why you need a writer and a poet. <laughs> anthology is the word I was grasping for. <laughs> Thank you, Goff. And our first one today is Whitson Court. Now, do you have any kind of feelings about Whitson Court before we get started? I don't really know it. I, I mean, even though there's I know Whitson area. I know it used to be a zoo, uh, um, a zoo there at one point. Yeah, with some zoo. Yeah, I'm I'm not familiar with that part of town at all. Okay, well here it is. Uh, this is oh, Whitson Court. Now, first of all, where we are is uh, it's not that far really from Llanwern House, um, right? And in fact, it has. Uh, well, we'll have a little. We'll talk about the architecture a little bit later on. As far as as why it's called Whitson, it has nothing to do with Pentecost. If, if there are any Christians watching this, nothing to do with Whitson Whitson. This yeah, is S O N. Oh, is it? Yes, which son? Um, and they think as go. I think it's probably more literal. Some suggest it might be to do with a settler way back when, but it might be more literal. Just as nearby Goldcliff is literal. Yeah. Uh, it may have come from white stone originally. Yeah, I'm wondering about that. The white, the white at the front. White yeah. stone. Is there a predominance of white stone around Whitson? Well, it got its name somewhere. There is white stone nearby, so it checks out. But whether that's the oh. real reason, we, we can only uh, sort of speculate these days. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, it's built, this house, in the grounds of a medieval tithe barn linked to Goldcliff Priory. And tantalisingly, it's on the site of an earlier house that I've really, in our lockdown climb, struggled to find out anything about. So I do apologise. Hmm. But it's, it's on the site of an earlier house. And this was built for a man called, uh, well, Phillips, William Phillips. We have uh, met the various Phillipses of Newport and the area, haven't we, Goff? We have Charles D. Phillips of the Gear, oh, the God. Emmeline Works. Yeah. It's the famous Sir Thomas Phillips as well. There's Squire Phillips of Risca that we haven't touched yet, but he pops up mm. in the future as well. There's lots of Phillipses in the area and they're all pretty active. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't realize that they were the Phillipses of a sort of clan. Yeah, they, they certainly seem to be in the air. It's also quite hard to find out how they are related to each other. Oh, right. <laughs> yes, they must be at some point. Anyway, this house was built by William Phillips um, in around about 1789 to 1791. So that's the kind of era we're talking about. And it was oh. the architect appears to have been Anthony Keck, who has an interesting CV. He did Margam, 
So we'll hear from him in the future. Highgrove and Underdown oh. in Ledbury. Oh, right. Although there are some suspiciously John Nash features. Mm. John Nash, of course, famous for Buckingham Palace, uh, the great yeah. Regency architect. And Marble <laughs> Arch was John Nash. So what was the year again of this 17? 1789 to 1791. Is a brick house unusual for this period? No, you get in there. I mean, it was unusual yeah. for this period if it was the 17th century, but we're the tail end of the 18th century, so it was yeah. really coming. Yeah, it's, it's fun though. You tend to see a lot of the sort of the Georgian houses tend to be stone fronted or at least stone faced, and of course, there's no facing on this at all, isn't there? Oh, yeah, no, that, that, that that's a very good point. Uh, the reason they think John Nash might have dabbled a little bit and added a little bit at the end, maybe, is because in 1791 he was working on Newport Bridge. So there are Nash touches, oh, and gosh. he was working on Newport Bridge in 1791. Oh, as, far as, as far as William Phillips goes, he, has, uh, he became one of the oldest magistrates in the county. He was still at it at 86 when he died. <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty good going for that period. He was doing <coughs> his job as old William Phillips. Um, yeah. More famous is his son, William Phillips Jr. And uh, he took over in uh, 1836 on the death of the old man. And there is a watercolour of uh, Whitson Court, uh, Whitson House, as it was called at this period, hmm. taken a year after his father's death. Let me uh, just, uh, there we are. Oh, that's, that's rather nice. Quite yes. naive, but very pleasant. Yeah, it is, it, it's not bad. This is done by James Edward Fitzgerald and this watercolor is in Canterbury Museum of all places. Oh gosh, 1837. Now, Will it, William Phillips Jr. is perhaps better known uh, to be of uh, being an anti-chartist in later years. He also was a magistrate, um, but an anti-chartist. He was at the Royal Oak Tavern in Chepstow, along with Mr. Thomas Prothero and Thomas Phillips, for an anti-chartist meeting, and uh, Whitson Court was the location for the uh, for a meeting of the West Monmouthshire Association for the Protection of Life and Property. Oh, another another yeah. anti-chartist meeting in yeah. 1839. Now, it, whatever William Phillips did, it didn't stop the rising, of course, in November of 1839, but it did get him presented to the Queen. He was at a levee at St. James's Palace and was presented by Reginald Blewett of Flantarnham Abbey. Oh, so but as the years roll on, he is, uh, you know, he, he gives a 10% uh, rebate to his tenants. He adores fishing. The whole place must have smelled of fish. When <laughs> William Phillips <laughs> Jr. lived there. He had a place in Bristol called uh, Salisbury Lodge in Clifton. And so he'd fish in Gloucestershire. He'd fish in Wiltshire. He'd fish in Monmouthshire. Uh, but yeah, I, I can only imagine the stench of fish from Whitson uh, House. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> Oh, not more fish, darling. <laughs> <laughs> now no, we have a, a job. <laughs> now, when he wasn't there, his brother was in residence. And this Mr. Phillips appears to have been a bit of a bruiser. He was described as being tall, stout, but firm. Hmm. And there was an incident that the law had to intervene in 1841. When Cornelius Mills, a peddler of Chippenham, turned up at Whitson to peddle his wares to the servants. Hmm. The servants didn't want to know about it, but on his way leaving the house, he crossed over uh, a field. And at that point, Mr. Phillips appeared to approach him and assault him, oh, God, breaking God. his collarbone, which was a little... Um, <laughs> it's, God. it's not a little bit um, uh, yeah. overly proportioned, really. Anyway, it got to the jury, it got to the, to the court, um, because Cornelius Mills, who was quite a little fellow, didn't like being assaulted by this large uh, man mountain yeah. of a man. Um, so it got to the got to court and it was quite amusing, actually, how it went. First of all, the Phillipses, who had a Phillips lawyer. Um, <laughs> there's always there's a Phillips lawyer, there's a Phillips merchant, there's a Phillips, yeah. <laughs> there's a Phillips for every occasion. <laughs> a very good lawyer. But his original plea was that he did not assault. Mr. Mills, until loads of eyewitnesses pointed out that they'd seen it. <laughs> it a blow. Well, well, he's supposed to have fallen on Mr. Phillips's fist, did he? <laughs> repeatedly. 
<laughs> repeatedly fell on his fist. So then he decided that, well, actually, it was self-defence and a brand new witness, a Mrs Jones, who suspiciously was watching from an upper window in Whitson Court itself. So not perhaps <laughs> impartial, who said that she indeed, indeed did see Mr Mills raise a hand to Mr Phillips initially. Mr Mills pointed out that he did indeed raise a hand. When he saw Mr Phillips come in, he went to doff his cap. <laughs> At this point, Mr. Phillips beat him to the ground. Oh, God. The local charmer. surgeon, the local <laughs> surgeon pointed out that Mr. Mills's uh, injuries were true and that he had a broken, uh, he had a fractured arm. So this was quite an assault. Uh, and so it seems cut and dried, but Charles Phillips, the lawyer, was extremely good, so much that the jury retired not agreeing initially on a verdict. Mm. Um, and then they had to be locked up after one member of the uh, jury had had enough and ran away to go to a pub. <laughs> <laughs> That's an escape. <laughs> or as it's put, as it, it's put <laughs> in the media at the time, they were then locked up after one gentleman had taken a hasty run for a refreshing sup and was caught <laughs> in the fact by the tip staff, who was a court bailiff. <laughs> I love the way that he's... He's decided to run away at this point, catch <laughs> an escape. In the end, Cornelius Mills won, but whether it was a Pyrrhic victory, I'll leave it to, for you to decide. He was, uh, uh, Phillips was charged at 10 shillings and no costs. So, you know, if his legal mm. fees were more than 10 shillings, then poor old Mr. Mills, the peddler, might have lost out there. Yeah. Don't know. Anyway, that's the way it was. It, it? It. Yeah, it's interesting the way the law operates at that period as well, isn't it? You're not sure whether... Uh, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, I heard the defence and, and cases and other things are represented. It's all very interesting. You may have represented himself. You may not You may not have even had anybody. It's, it's difficult to tell, isn't it? Hmm. Well, William Phillips, Jr. dies in 1872, age 77. So there are very long-lived clan hmm. Phillipses at this stage. Um, again... <laughs> All the uh, sort of obituaries talk about his fishing and the wording of some of them. There was an enormous fish he caught, but the way they've worded it, it took him half an hour to kill the fish. <laughs> now, half an hour to catch the fish, perhaps, but it makes it sound like there was a man versus fish battle on the, on the sea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were rolling around the bankside. <laughs> Fish got him down in a Goston crab. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm glad this is free, this podcast. Right? <laughs> anyway, when he dies, eventually it passes on to his grandson, the wonderfully named, and you can see him in this picture, St. John Knox Rickards Phillips. Oh. <laughs> Getting close to the 20th century here. Now, one yeah. thing, this, this is a great photograph of uh, Knox uh, Phillips with his <coughs> wife. But can you see, I mean, this architectural style of what's known as the blind window always yeah. interests me. Now the blind yeah. window, it, this appears to have been built this way. I mean, it is part of the symmetry of the building, but of course, blind mm. windows became well known because of window tax, of course. Well, yes, quite, that's what I was wondering. And window tax, I mean, window tax was there in 1696 and it wasn't repealed until 1851. In France, not until 1926. Oh, good, good Lord. So the idea was that they were hitting, because this is before, in, uh, most of it is before income tax, which came in with Pitt and the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah. So they're trying to get money out of aristocrats, but it does rather backfire because if you're poor and you live in a tenement building with lots of windows, mm. what happens is the owner of the tenement puts up your, your rent. Yeah. So it did tend to hit the poor as well as the rich yeah. as window yeah, tax. Right, yeah. But I think this was part of the original design of the building and nothing to do with window tax. But you can never be 100% sure. You, you wonder whether it becomes a sort of design statement. You're saying, you know, uh, about uh, about the aesthetic of the of avoiding the tax. You know, it becomes a sort of, mm. yeah. Become, mm. Yeah, because it seems odd to actually do that at a point where you, when it wasn't necessary sort of thing. Yeah, one of my uh, uh, sort of uh, apocryphal historical uh, sort of references, which isn't true, there's no scholarly uh, research on this that proves it at all, is the fact that you're literally robbing daylight by having to block up your windows, oh, and so uh, daylight robbery. But actually, 
oh, right, Actually, yeah. it doesn't quite fit, but it, yeah. I, it should. It's one of those yeah. historical nonsenses should, that should fit, really, shouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, he didn't live long, this poor bloke. He died in, in no. 1930. He, he died actually in 1901, I believe, at the age of 38. Oh, gosh. That's what happens. Um, he had a splendid mm. name. The chap who took over had a splendid name. Father Oliver Road Vassal Phillips. And it stopped being a family home at this point because Father Vassal Phillips uh, allowed an order of nuns to take over. Oh, right. And they were the Sacramentines of Bernay and the perpetual adorers of the Blessed Sacrament. Wonderful names they had at Whitson at this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They Cracking were exiled point. from France um, because of, of, uh, of, uh, of worship. Exiled from France. They weren't allowed to set up a school as Knox Ricard's Phillips himself. Uh, sorry, as, the, as Father Oliver Rhodes Vassal Phillips says. The order of nuns' existence is precarious, for they are not permitted to open a school. Their days are spent in prayer, adoration, and the making of altar breads, vestments, and church ornaments. It's oh, gosh. An odd sort of convent yeah. the, in the early 20th century. It'd be strange. Oh, and in 1910, this pavilion here burnt. Yeah. It was used as the laundry, and there was a terrible fire and that was burnt and lost its roof in 1910. Porch, by the way, was added in the 1860s. That's why it looks different yeah, from the watercolour. It, it looked a definite sort of a definite 19th century porch, that, wasn't it? Definitely. <coughs> Good news for the nuns. In 1911, it was decided that they could move to New York, where they were oh. allowed to open a school. So that was good. Oh. So yeah. what, what they did with Whitson Court, now called Whitson Court rather than Whitson House, it became a training school for their African <coughs> nations. So Whitson was a training school. And we got some interesting sort of images from that period. Mm. So there we are, the ivy running wild there. Our okay. Lady of Perpetual Sucker, African missions. African missions, oh gosh. There they are. And a few internals. The reception room. Mm. And very good, the Oratory College, which is interesting wording. And I quite like the fact, I know it wasn't the nuns that played football, but I kind of want it to have been. <laughs> this is their football I, ground. <laughs> I've, I've played football with nuns. Have you? I, indeed. As what a child, I was, football a, with nuns? I was a chorister in, uh, in St. David's at Betty's as a child. And the... Uh, the vicar that took over, for, uh, yeah, the vicar called Father Matthews, who was there, um, took all the choir out on a trip to a convent in Cardiff. Oh. And we had tea with the nuns and played football with them out the back. How you never know, it? it might have been the nuns. It might have been Our Lady of Perpetual Sucker First Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you know how, just as a departure, do you know how Tom Baker, the actor, decided he wanted to be an actor? That's when he was a choir boy. Oh, or chorister at least, and he was yeah. had to work at a funeral, and it was a very cold day, and he got tears in his eyes, and they thought he was crying, and one of the mourners put money in his hand because he thought that Tom Baker, the child, had been moved. So he thought, well, this is good, and he became an actor. <laughs> he faked crying at every funeral afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so the so the nuns were there for I mean a little while. You had the African missions and um, there's a great moment during the First World War when a nun was arrested, you know, Goff. <laughs> well, they had French nuns that came there and uh, one of them went out wandering. And of course, they weren't allowed during the First World War without license. So she was arrested. Oh, I mean, the truth isn't as glamorous as the headline in fairness, is it? Nun gets oh. arrested. No, no, quite, yeah. <laughs> because she didn't have the right paperwork and didn't realize she had yes. gone beyond the thing. Yeah. But uh, you, you have to be careful of nuns. Remember World War II when everybody believed that the German parachuters would come dressed as nuns for some I reason. Know. I know. I know. Well, put, put the fear of God in me, that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing worse than a stormtrooper it's a cross dressing stormtrooper with ecclesiastic clothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dear old Whitson did not remain as a as a place of the nuns of uh, perpetual succor for that long, because in 1917 it was put up for sale again. 
And here we have the uh, oh. rather battered advert for it. Yeah. Interesting that they say that if you buy it, it comes with the lordship of the manor of Whitson, because it does. The Phillips oh. were the lords of the manor of Whitson. So that came. King's Head Hotel, 1917. Yeah. Thing is, though, it stayed empty for a long time, which, of course, is fatal to these houses, isn't it? Oh, quite, yes. Yeah. Absolutely oh, yeah. fatal. But eventually a man from Ridgeway, Mr. Garraway Smith, uh, bought it. And his niece, Olive Mabry, and her husband, William, a builder's merchant, um, stayed there as well. And in World War II, we got a picture of it. Now, these, this collection of people, I believe, are uh, beekeepers. The Association of Beekeepers in 1941 had their meeting for some reason at Whitson Court. Yeah. And there they all are. God. Crammed in there. Yeah. Certain buzz of enthusiasm, I feel. Oh, dear <laughs> me, this is getting <laughs> bad. I, I somehow, Goff, I think we no longer have 153 subscribers. <laughs> I know you can see it ticking down as we talk. <laughs> it was inevitable, quite frankly. I'm amazed we got this far. Uh, yes, the, <laughs> yes the, they are all there. Also in World War II, they had two Jewish German refugees, two teenagers. Oh, um, yes. Uh, we're at Whitson. But unfortunately, the Luftwaffe did use it as a marker when bombing Newport docks. Oh, gosh. So, uh, and that was confirmed after the war. They used it yeah. as a marker. Now, this niece I told you about, I think actually she might be on this photograph, but I don't want to point her out because I'm not sure which one it is. So do forgive yeah. me. Um, there is a person who will know, actually, her grandson, Adam Greenland, who used to live here, he often posts a lot about Whitson Court on mm. the on a Facebook group, the, the Pictures and Memories of Newport, which is a very yeah. good group, and he will know exactly. Um, he Adam Greenland does say something rather interesting, but does make me wonder. He has written, and I'm not sure how to take this, Goff, that when it was the nuns in charge of Whitson Court, he writes, 13 entered, but only three were seen to leave. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> it is slightly worrying, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, though, Mrs. Maybury took over. And Mrs. Maybury mm -hmm. was very well known in Newport. She owned quite a lot of property in Newport, especially in Pill. And she was a, quite a popular landlady, but she would um, arrive for the rent herself. So no agent. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Maybury would turn up on your doorstep in Dolphin Street um, mm -hmm. for the rent. So the Maybreys were extremely well known. But the point is, after the war, what do you do with a place like this? I mean, it's a sizable oh. place, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's significant that it survived, um, you know, as, as training colleges and, and convents and things like that. Because, again, it's a, these are, trying to maintain these houses as domestic properties becomes very, very difficult. It certainly does. I mean, she opened the grounds for children um, uh, mm -hmm. in the 19 in 1950s and 60s and then an odd thing uh, approach you mentioned the zoo earlier on goff yeah and what happened was mrs maybury uh, was offered two himalayan mountain bear cubs called yogi and boo boo it's the 50s and 60s okay. <laughs> which had been used as an advertising gimmick for reynolds department store <coughs> in newport so she thought well i'll do that and the kids might enjoy seeing mm. them i mean there is such a thing in the area called the whitson treat Whitson as in Pentecost, I presume. Yeah. So I think it's quite fun if you go to, on the Whitson treat to Whitson Court. Oh, right. So there is no, yeah. <laughs> it's got nothing no, yeah. to do with Pentecost. No. But anyway, what? so it became a zoo. It did, as you rightly said, became Whitson Zoo for many years, run by Mrs. Maybury. And they had Yogi and Boo Boo. Um, they also had two European sun bears called Barbara and Basil. They had a range oh. of exotic birds. They had Jason the lion. Oh, there right. Were, there were lionesses there. There were monkeys. There was an aquarium. There was a reptile house. There was Fluellen the llama. <laughs> there was a cockatoo who swore too much to be allowed to face the public. That's very Lord <laughs> Tradiga, that, isn't it? That is, yeah. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, um, Lord Tradiga, Evan Tradiga of the 30s and 40s was great with birds as well. Um, and in fact, it is true, it's not a myth, as I, I saw online, that he did uh, train his parrot to crawl up the inside of his trouser leg and poke its head out through his fly buttons at parties. But that wasn't a macaw. They had macaws, actually, at uh, 
Whitson yeah. Zoo as well. It was a little Australian parakeet that he used yeah. to do that. But he also had um, um, Blue Boy, a hyacinth macaw, who would also swear ferociously. Yeah. There's a story oh, yeah. of uh, a prince of the church turning up at Tredega House and asking Blue Boy how he is. And Blue Boy replied in a pithy phrase of no more than two words and told him exactly where to go. <laughs> So, you know, you, when you've got birds that can talk, you are risking quite a bit. So I understand Whitson's problem, quite frankly. <laughs> there was also smaller animals, Cassius, the German shepherd, we remember you, Zimba, the Great Dane. Um, there are all kinds of animals there. There was apparently an escape by a boa constrictor at one point, which is slightly Blimey. alarming. Yeah. They found him just in time. Uh, and also Adam Greenland posts a piece of memorabilia. He reckons, and I probably agree with him, it's the only bit of memorabilia of its time, the only Whitson Zoo mug in the entire world remaining. And there it is. Oh, isn't that absolutely splendid? No, oh. Adam Greenland, we... Uh... Yeah, I will. <laughs> Do the happy dance to own something like that. As well, but it's... It'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's nicely yeah. made as well, actually, isn't it? <laughs> you know, we, you know, we're talking about Mrs. Mabry in a zoo of that time. Of course, attitudes have changed towards how you look after animals. Mm. That has to be pointed out. And oh, in yes. 1980, the choice was safari parks were in. Could she have the money to turn Whitson into a safari park? Uh, and in the end, it was too difficult. So the animals uh, left and uh, it stopped becoming a zoo in 1980, Goff. That's when it stopped yes. becoming a zoo. So uh, she did do her, her bit, Mrs. Mabry. In yeah. fact, Mrs. Mabry lived to the age of 99 and she lived there right up until 1998 when she died. Oh, well, I never do that. Interesting. Yeah. And then, of course, once things are left, uh -huh. Mrs. Whitson looking a little bit sorry for itself with mm. boarded up windows. Mm. <laughs> this time it's boarded up, nothing to do with window tax. No, yeah. <laughs> Just to stop people getting in. Yeah. But we actually have a happy ending for this one, Goff, hmm. because oh, really? the Collinborn family bought it. And Collinborns are Newport auctions, so car auctions and things like that. Yep. And they bought it and they managed to restore it, fully restore it, oh. under the guidance of Cadu. So this is how you restore a property. Yep. So there we are, relatively recently. They're Good restoring Lord. it. And look how sad it looked there. Yeah. This is how it looks now. Oh, that's blended, isn't it? Look at that. Brilliant, isn't it? They've done a oh, fantastic yeah. job. Oh, and yeah. Cadu watching as well. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, there are sort of car auctions and things that go on there that I think uh, John Collinborn, John Collinborn, who bought it, used to be the postboy for this area. Oh, well, well, well. <laughs> the amount of times he must <laughs> have pedaled past and thought, I'm going to yeah. own that house one day. And he only went and did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there we are with the whole uh, car idea. Cars are sold from there. But interesting thing here, Goff, hmm. look at the pavilion. Still isn't rebuilt from the fire in 1910. Oh, yeah, it's quite, yeah. But I'm glad oh, they've got something. gates because you yeah. don't want peddlers from Chippenham. No, no, you can't. You can't have to be beaten by a Colin Bourne. <laughs> can't keep belting them, can you? It's tiresome. <laughs> But I have to say, um, extremely well done, because you know me, I'm extreme romantic when it comes to history. I like mm. little nods to the historic past. Well, mm. Faye Collinborn put this picture up on, uh, on uh, Facebook and she'd spotted something and she decided to put it up as a garden feature. And brilliant work by Faye, because it's this. It's the old sign. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, how splendid. <laughs> How's that for a garden feature? Yeah, that's great, isn't it? <laughs> Marvellous. For years, if you would get like an AA road map, as you see, that there used to be the little symbol for zoo at over Whitson on the, on the map. Long after it had, the zoo had gone, the, the symbol for zoo was still there. Oh, I'm not sure really? whether it... Yeah, I'm not sure whether it still exists at the moment, but the symbol for zoo is still present. Oh. <laughs> well, well, that was Whitson. Happy ending, I think we'll agree. Yeah, man. And then we go oh, yeah, considering, one... considering yeah. this, you know, it could have, you know, you, you can see by the time you get the rest, rest, restoration of it, the roof had clearly gone as the roof's off. And that's that's the death of buildings when the roof goes. Oh, so it, it may not have lasted that much longer had somebody not got in there. So we're going from Whitson with a happy ending um, mm. to Stelvio, which was in Bayes Leg, 
Road, and I'll show you exactly what's on the spot of Stelvio yeah. House um, when we get to it. Do you have any, uh, does Stelvio ring any bells for you, Goff, other than the road names today? Because it didn't really uh, me. I, I, remember, I remember seeing the house, driving past the house many times um, when it was still standing. And of course, um, the scandal that concerned its end. But that's yeah. all I really know about the property. Which we will certainly touch on. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there are very few <laughs> decent photographs of Stelvio. I know there are interior photographs available, um, but of mm. course, under lockdown, we are confined to what we can mm. find online, really. So do forgive that. Um, but here's Stelvio. Mm. Um, again, it's it's uh, it turned out to be an extremely important place. This is built mm. in 1893 for a chap called Charles H. Bailey, or as he was always known, C.H. Bailey. Mm. And he was a man who was born uh, in Finsbury, um, but he got into engineering. And he is an utterly self-made man, C.H. Bailey. He was the son of an engineer, and Stelvio is a ship. It's a ship. Oh, I've often wondered what where, where Stelvio came from. Yeah, either he worked on it. I've, someone says he was the chief engineer on the ship Stelvio, but I can't mm. find the facts of that. His dad was an engineer, so maybe he was. Mm. But either way, Stelvio the ship had a place in the heart of C.H. Mm. Bailey. Uh, he was an apprentice on Tyneside, where he met his first wife, Charlotte Richardson. Uh, she was from uh, Tynemouth. And that whole Tyne thing... Uh, does ring a bell because he, he moved to Newport in 1880 where he saw business possibilities. He was described as having great ability, energy and powers of organisation. And so Newport was a huge opportunity in the 1880s. And it is safe to say that mm. C.H. Bailey grasped the opportunity because he was the sole proprietor of, well, there he is, there's C.H. Bailey. Ah. Set him up, and then all of a sudden, it was a bit of a damp squib. I'm sorry, CJ. <laughs> I just forget what the next image is going to be. There he is. Um, he was the sole proprietor of this magnificent place here. This is Mill Parade, Newport, and this is the Tyne Engine and Ship Works. Gosh, I, I, I seem to remember something about this. I knew the name Bailey, and I, and I was associated in a maritime context, but... I've never seen it. It's astonishing. He helped put Newport on the worldwide map. Uh, he yeah. did dry docks and uh, ship maintenance. Uh, also, he ended up having a, an equally large place in Barry, and it became a worldwide organization. This, the Tyne, of course, from where his wife has come from, uh, mm. where he had his apprenticeship. Uh, but this is rebuilt, unfortunately, uh, for, unfortunately or fortunately, because his mm. initial one burnt in the great fire of Newport. It would, have been the great, it would have been the great fire of Newport if not for an anonymous Swedish sailor who saved a lot of the town, in my opinion. It's January 1891, God, and it is frozen solid everywhere in Newport at that very harsh winter. And a blacksmith at the Tyne Engineering Works, it's, uh, it says Alexandra Road, but hmm. Alexandra Road Mill Parade, Blacksmith was looking at some small pieces of iron lying in the storeroom of the Tyne Engineering Works when the lamp he had in his hand ignited a little cotton waste. This burnt up and caught a stack of new boat oars above and started a conflagration. Good go. C.H. Bailey was in the clerk's office in a different block writing a letter to a gentleman in connection with the Barry branch of the firm. And he smelt smoke. Then he heard a cry of alarm from the storeroom. There was not a drop of water on the premises because the frost was so intense. And the fire rapidly gained ground in the storeroom. Workmen hurried to help, but they couldn't enter the storeroom. Mm. Because of the heat. So they mm. grabbed books and ledgers and threw them into safes, trying to save the paperwork. Mm. They used the telephone. And within seven or eight minutes, the uh, hose cart hooked onto a cab arrived. Mm. And they found that the hydrants were frozen solid. Oh, God. It was the old hydrants, which didn't yeah. have a frost cock, which meant it absolutely froze. Yeah. The river was at low level. They couldn't get water from there either. Everything mm -hmm. went wrong. The fire ran down the machinery showroom. It went through the doors of the showroom into the front of the new building. Then half a dozen wagons caught a light as well. That woodwork began to blaze. If it wasn't for this Swedish sailor, who was yeah. unnamed, who managed to get a hydrant working, they said that the Swedish sailor, his clothes started to smoke. 
they were convinced he was going to bur- he was going to become a light at any time. The oh, whole good. of the premises was doomed. It all burnt down. The safe fell through the floor. The whole premises was totally destroyed. You could see the flames for miles around, and the heat was so intense that the worker that the uh, water in the roadway was speedily converted into vapor. Good grief! It burnt for ninety minutes. Yeah. Good God. Destroyed it. Bailey reckoned that he lost 15 grand, which is close to 1.4 million in today's money. Bit of a blow, isn't it? Yeah, astonishing. In the hydrants, they found a core of ice six inches long. So everything was frozen in Newport in 1891. Good Lord. C.H. Bailey bounced back. Um, Again, as you can see here, he rebuilt in magnificent style and expanded his business. He was also an author. He wrote lots of little books, and I'd like to own one. I'm sure they cost a fortune these days. My yeah. favorite is this. C.H. Bailey's Book of Useful Information. Prior to the engine works Barry and at Newport, yeah. Monmouthshire. Yeah. <laughs> Price seven and six. <laughs> <laughs> so he and Charlotte built Stelvio, moved in there, and, when, and uh, sadly, Charlotte died at the age of 40. <coughs> And then he remarried to a lady we'll talk about in a second. But when he was on his honeymoon, I, I believe, there was the great gale of Newport in, in 1895. Don't moan about the weather, Goff, because... No. And uh, in fact, it was so bad that um, in the service, the congregation at St. Wallace Church reported three yards of the roof was bodily removed during this gale, during the service, lifted bodily away as the service was proceeding. And at Stelvio, the new house, a three flued stack, the chimney, fell through the roof and strewed the fine billiard room with debris. Mm -hmm. So really, quite frankly, the weather in Newport is not being kind to C.H. Bailey and his new business, is it? No, it's knocking his house down. (laughs) Letting his building, his properties burn. Do keep an eye out. If you ever see C.H. Bailey's book of useful information, Goff, do let me know. Yeah. (laughs) Because he did others. They were illustrated, but he did about four or five books. uh, And they're diagrams inside. And then they sold really well. They're fantastic. You really do want to know what he can say the piece of useful information, don't you? (laughs) Mostly, Mostly engineering stuff, it has to be said. Oh, right. Mostly engineering stuff. So his second wife was this incredibly important woman in Newport's history. Now, again, C.H. Bailey, oh. doesn't he always <laughs> pop up when I'm talking she about something been, else? Remarkably like her husband, didn't she? <laughs> they could pass she a male off. impersonator? <laughs> <laughs> right, do you know what I'm going to do now? You were a great man, C.H. Bailey, and I admire you greatly, but I'm going to kill you off now. <laughs> he died in 1907 at Stelvio. Uh, he had an illness that puzzled people, and he died at the age of 59. So I've now killed off the great man. Oh, so I will talk about the woman who took over the business on her husband's death. Right. She looks mischievous, I think you'll agree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is Gertrude Buchanan. You could say that he swapped a Tyneside girl for a Wearside girl because she was born in Sunderland. Oh, right. Um, she was she spent a lot of time in Canada, and she lived in London as well before she moved to Newport. Uh, she is important. She was known as Lady Bountiful. Lady Rhonda would have been proud of her because she became one of the foremost business women in this neck of the woods because she mm. was running, you know, the Tyne Works. Mm. Um, and her sons helped out, but she was the uh, figurehead. Lady Bountiful. She continued to run the company until her son George took over. She was very involved with the Royal Gwent Hospital. She was chair of the Monmouthshire uh, Prisoner of War Committee during the Great War. But I think the best thing she did is something I'd never heard really of. Let's see her look a bit grander. There she is, Lady Bountiful. Uh, Mrs. C.H. Phillips, Gertrude Phillips. Uh, Sorry, Bailey, sorry. Um, In the First World War, when you have uh, women working at munition factories, the one slight problem is if they're young mothers in those days, who looks after the kids? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. Well, she thought of this and she founded something in Alexander, Alexandra Street. And it was, as you can see, a munitions crash. A brilliant idea. Oh. Munitions crash on the day of its opening in 1917. So if you're a yeah. woman, you're working in the munitions factories. Mrs. Bailey, 
will look, will arrange to have your kids looked after here. Yeah. And if you're wondering where that is now, there it is. Same building, uh, but the, the front door is not there. Picture's not showing up, Paul. We've uh, we've still got Mrs. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, Mrs. Bailey. Well, that's disappointing. Well, let me have a try then. Let me end the share and let's have a little look there. Is that showing up? Yes, here we are. There we are. Yes, there we are. Munitions crash. There we go. The munitions crash. There we yeah. are in Alexandra Road. Yeah. And uh, to see it as it is now, here it is. Oh, gosh, yes. The door used to be there, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was quite intriguing. Oh, yeah. Oh, for all this, that, she really. was... I mean, for all this work that she did, she was uh, rewarded. They made her a CBE. So she's yeah. one of the premier sort of business women in Wales, I would have thought at the time. Mm. She had sons as well, of course, that would try and take on the family business. George took on yeah. the family business. Her other sons, including Charles, mm. um, he was also in interesting. He was involved in various things. Let's have a little look at Charles. There's Charles. Looking happy ah. with a propeller. Yep. Yeah, this is Charles Bailey. And he was in, you'll like him, Goff, because he was interested in the wireless. Oh, really? <laughs> he was interested in wireless technology. And what he did at Stelvio was he experimented in it. In 1910, he had a portable set and he gradually evolved into a transmitting and receiving station from Stelvio. Good God. It used to be a little tower Good. room where I think. Yeah. It was in later years, someone called it the telescope room and said it's where mm. C.H. Bailey used to look for his ships. But I think it might have been the room where Charles Bailey set yeah. up his wireless experiment. Oh, yeah. um, now, he could transmit 40 miles, so Radio Stelvio, <laughs> and receive 1,400 miles. Of course, this is in the old electrolyte crystal detector days, you know, that sort mm. of thing. He traveled on the Aquitania to New York to visit the largest wireless stations. Um, and he was a founder of the Newport and a South Wales Wireless Society. So he was well into oh, it. Yeah. I would humbly suggest that any new radio station taken in Newport should call themselves Radio Stelvio. Radio Stelvio. Stelvio FM. That would only <laughs> make sense to a handful of people and the viewers of this podcast. <laughs> so a handful of people. <laughs> <laughs> a tad niche, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe oh, I don't care. It's there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm certain that's sad days, I'm afraid, for uh, for Charles. So he was interested in all of this. Hmm. But I'm afraid his death. Let's see if I can sort this out where, where you can all share it. Can you see that newspaper, Goff? Yes. Captain Charles uh -huh. Bailey killed in French rail crash. Oh, gosh, dear. What a shame. 1935, yeah. um, he was on a train and killed in a crash. This chap next to him had been in a couple of train crashes and always survived, but poor old Charles yeah. was killed. Oh, gosh. So he reached the age of... Uh, but you saw him. I showed you with him with what looks like a propeller, didn't I? There he is. Yes. Looks like yeah. a propeller. He wasn't the most successful of all the aeronauts and pilots of his family. George mm. was in the flying corps and later take, took over the company from his mother, mm. um, who uh, handed it over in the 1920s. But there was also this youngest son who we've talked about, who we've mentioned privately between us, mm. Goff, W.R. Bailey. Now, was yeah. he successful? Exactly. Yes. Well, yes. Who who knows, really? <laughs> he, if he was alive today, you would have called him um, um, a fan of extreme sports. Because <laughs> he was extremely, he was a very popular young man. Uh, he, he was very popular in the area. They liked him. Um, but he was, into, again, in the hunting field, the hunting fraternity, he's always charging horses far too fast and got way, way into um, flying. So he was an aeronaut, an amateur aeronaut. And this is William I mean, Richardson Bailey, isn't William, it? Younger William brother Richardson Charles. Bailey. Now, whether he was a successful aeronaut, we don't really know, because he was notorious for crashing. <laughs> so, I mean, he'd crashed once. Uh, he crashed in a field close to us in 1920 while flying in a Monkswood estate near us and forced to make a descent with his enjo engine billowing smoke. Nosedive, managed to stabilise, then landed in a stubby field 
and his brother Charles and the chauffeur went out and actually managed to get him. Tank petrol tank burst into flames, and they just managed. He managed to leap out just in time, you know. Um, mm -hmm. He clearly said he really he loved flying. That was his one of his main sort of preoccupations with life. Um, when they were living in a, their mother's his mother's country country property at Crick Howell, which is now the Glyface Country um, beg your pardon, Glyface Country Hotel. Um, he used to actually go, he used to fly down to Newport, collect the mail, and fly it back up to Glyphase. So he was basically doing the postman's job. He was also, he used to cause his friends extremely anxious moments by flying time and again through the legs of the transporter bridge at Newport. Now, oh, I'm yeah. sure, I've been looking, searching around to see if I can find this. I'm sure I've seen a picture of an aircraft flying under and through the legs of the transporter bridge but I can't track it down anywhere. Now, am I projecting? Am I sort of thinking of other things? I don't know. But if you know of an extant picture of an aircraft flying through in the 20s, let us know or stick it on our Facebook page so we can see where it is. Mm. So he was great. But one of his great sort of, sorry, well, I say great, one of his sort of um, main aircraft, if I can sort of just get back on and share this for you. Um, I've been looking at the trying to find he flew something called an Avro in 1922, a chocolate-coloured Avro. <gasps> a Alamy stock photo. Hurrah! Ah, there now, is. this is a... Now, I, the problem with the article, the newspaper article that you read about the aircraft, is that it, it doesn't mention the number. But this is an Avro 504, and it says 1922, and again, it's a dark colour. So it's possible it, it, it was similar to this, similar design to this type of vehicle. So it's good old... Wooden biplane, wooden canvas biplane. Yeah, and he was he was very very you know often seen flying above Newport in this thing. However, as as things mostly were given with him, it didn't stay up in the air for terribly long. Um, uh, oh, and I'll put it back up a little bit before we go, just so you can still see him when I read this bit. Um, because he was involved in a very very nasty crash. Um, Let's have a look at this little piece for you. And it says uh, in, the, in the piece here, uh, New, uh, this is the Western Mail, Monday, May the 8th, 1922. Newport Airman injured. Serious accident to Mr. W. R. Bailey. Mechanic also hurt in the crash. So basically, he, essentially, he'd gone up in the air uh, with three fellow pass two fellow passengers. Well, not necessarily, but they make some distinction between taking passenger flights and being there for a purpose. So Bailey was the pilot, a chap called Jeffrey Watkins, um, who was, um, had been a former member of the Air Force during the First World War, was up as the mechanic in it. So the pilot had a mechanic in the craft with him, which is quite interesting. But they also took up another young guy called Fred Smith of Penclean Avenue, Newport, a young man who appeared to be eager to sort of enter the service of Mr. Bailey. So he's more or less sort of gone along for He'd been trying to get employment out of him. So the Bailey decides to take him up in the aircraft, say a chocolate coloured Avro, which he'd housed in an aerodrome um, not far from a blacksmith shop in Keffen Road in Newport, Keffen Newport Road. Um, so the, uh, it was just disaster. Fred describes the disaster in, in the most effective terms. They took off um, and in about 100 yards, they'd shot up the 600 foot. Mm. But when they got there, something went wrong. And over the next hundred yards, they came precipitously straight downwards, um, nose first, for the other hundred foot. So they only flew about 100, 200 feet mm. straight up, oof, straight back down again, smashed into the ground. Um, apparently, they'd gone up to take photographs. He liked taking aerial photographs, particularly over you know, the area we call Little Switzerland, Newport, yeah. Top Ridge, we always the bottom of the Monmouthshire Hills and the, the canal, mm. etc., that goes through. It's a beautiful area still today. Lovely sunny day, go up there, sit on the bench and have a look at it. And you can see it. They were flying over this, which is why they thought they were keeping quite low mm. and taking photographs. And something just went wrong and the plane was going down very steeply. Um, Bailey managed to steer it away from some buildings, but it crashed head first into a field not far from the Rising Sun Inn. And he was at, Bailey was actually pinned into the wreckage. Um, so he was quite, he had to be hacked out with an axe, apparently. Um, yeah. Broke both his legs, unconscious, um, cuts on the head, various things. 
So they managed to get in there very quickly. The Newport the gossip, as usual, spread around, saying that, um, you know, I mean, Jeffrey Watkins, the mechanic, was also injured, but not so severely. Um, but Fred Smith uh, was apparently reported to have just jumped out of the aircraft just before it hit the ground and walked around in a terribly casual manner, wow. having a look at it. Now, this is entire gibberish. Yeah, is that possible? <laughs> no, of course it bloody isn't. You know, you're, still, you're going down that way. So, but no, he was in the aircraft. Fred was in the aircraft when it hit the ground, um, but he wasn't in a part of the, the vehicle that crumpled uh, and, and got old, so he didn't get tangled in it. So he got out. The reason he was wandering around in a casually casual fashion was he was dazed and in a state of shock. Oh, so they turn out, all these people flood to the, the scene because they hundreds of people what saw this plane come down. They zoom up on bicycles and on and in cars and good on foot and they charge up to this site. And he's sort of wandering around in a daze, trying to see what had happened to the people in the front of it. And he says, It was my first flight. <laughs> I was not a passenger in an ordinary sense, so I was not working on the machine. In fact, it wasn't a passenger trip. So, so the poor guy's his first time in an aircraft trying to get work out of Bailey and he ends up straight in the ground. Um, There's early days, they do actually, there is the, the Air Ministry does investigate it uh, to see what is going on. So there is a, a start of the early sort of plane crash investigation type things. Um, so poor old Fred, though, at the end of it, he says, I was stunned a bit at the time and did not feel much hurt. I got out and walked around to see if I could see what had happened to Mr. Bailey and Watkins. Um, as the machine was smashed. But I felt so upset <laughs> that I cannot tell what happened or how the other two were got out. You see, I was new to any such experience and I did not know anything about it. I felt very dazed on the road home. <laughs> the next plane crash, you'll know better. You'll know better. Poor little bugger. You know? <laughs> and then, like, they have called into the crowd. He's standing there, hands in pockets, whistling cheerfully, you know. Mm. But, um, no, I mean, they, Bailey did survive. He was very ill for a while. His friends were worried that he was going to lose both his legs because he broke both of them uh, <laughs> below the knee, fractured, a, um, dislocated the shoulder and various He didn't things. meet Mr. Phillips of Whitson Court by any chance, did he? <laughs> no, but, no, he didn't, but, you know. um, but no, but luckily he did. He survived very, very well. Um, and as usual, when situations like this occur, the Newport people of Newport did what they always do, charge out in a mass and gawp at it. <laughs> because it's it, it, the ability of people in Newport to form a crowd with the drop of a hat at any point in the early part of the 20th century is quite astonishing. So thousands of curious sightseers <laughs> flooded into this field and they erected a roped barricade around it so you could look at the blood-strained wreck of the machine, oh, which yeah, still lay on yeah. its side with the driving seat embedded in soil. So there we go. Mm. Yeah, so what actually happened to it, I haven't, uh, haven't found any sort of uh, statement about what actually did bring the plane down. But he did, sur he survived that unpleasantness. Um, but sadly, uh, ultimately it caught up with him. Um, he did this, not this accident specifically, um, but Paul Bailey um, had a riding accident just after the Second World War. Um, and he meant he couldn't fly and he couldn't ride anymore. And he sadly took his own life in 1949 um, in Depletton. So, Paul, well, yeah. Well, you can see someone who seems to have been, again, what we consider maybe an adrenaline junkie nowadays, to have lost, lost all of that. Must have been a great, a great man, even, in his, even at the age of 48. Um, so, yeah, so he had a sad end. He survived many plane crashes. But eventually, but ultimately, yeah. depression okay. took him away. Very, very sad. Yeah. yeah. Your picture was far better than the one I had. I think that's a later Avro, isn't it? Looks oh, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't say. I just sort of looked, looked, tried to match things up with dates because without any number being given, it is really speculation at this point. Yeah. I'm sure an Avro <coughs> expert will let us know. Um, uh, well, if you do, if anybody does know the type of plane it was and what it was, again, tell us because we, we'd be very delighted to put a picture up on the Facebook page. Oh, please do. Now, isn't this a lovely portrait of Gertrude Bailey? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, wearing her CBE. I've got to say, but yeah, wearing her, wearing her gong. Now, she was, uh, this is owned by Newport uh, Art Gallery, Newport Museum and Art Gallery, which is quite fitting, as I'll point out. I think it needs a bit of, it needs restoration, apparently, from what I've yeah. read. 
Uh, but it'd be nice to put her back on display because she was the most important woman in Newport. I'd never heard about Goff. Right. Um, in the end, she headed off to Kenya. That's where she spent her last days. She headed mm -hmm. off to Kenya. They had family links in Kenya. Her daughter Beth had surprisingly married uh, a Mr. Llewellyn with links to Malpas Court without telling anyone, I think. And yeah. Llewellyn was big in the colony of Kenya. And so they moved out there. And ultimately, so did the mother. Mm. So she moved out to Kenya, where she died in 1941, the age of 70. But when you sure. think uh, the era she lived and what she achieved as a, as a business uh, woman mm. um, was quite extraordinary, really. Um, so there she is. But of course, the, the question is, or when she dies, there is a huge... Have you ever seen the Bailey family plot at St. Wallace Cemetery, Goff? No, I haven't, no. It's this. Oh, it's been blimey. restored since, so it now looks really white. And I'm a big fan of this. Uh, there was a local Newport legend which said the Baileys left Stelvio because they were sick of looking out of the window and looking at their dead ancestors. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is near Newport's, uh, it is near St. Willis Cemetery, of course, Bays Lake yeah. Road and Stelvio House. But actually, I don't think you could see it from the windows in Stelvio. Oh, right, no. I love these wonderful <laughs> things. But yeah. it, it's quite a, a, a thing, isn't it? Oh, um, it is. And I do like the way it's updated with what I can only describe as little post-it notes. And I'll show you what I mean. This is an update. And you've got this, which has oh, popped yes. up since. You've got Patricia Merriel. Yeah. Measured her love and warmth. And we've got Christopher Humphrey Bailey. Yeah. A remarkable man and lover of Africa. So yes, 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 I quite like yes, these sort of yes. informal post-it notes that appear on the Bailey tomb every time somebody dies and is buried there. Um, yeah, marvelous <laughs> stuff, really. Marvelous yeah. stuff. But by the way, the Baileys continued running the firm, which renamed itself from the Tyne Works to C.H. Bailey Company. Hmm. But what of Stelvio, as we see here, poking out amongst the prefabs? Yeah. Well, after she sold it, she sold it um, to, uh, who did she sell it to? She sold it to a, a, a knight of the realm, Sir John Davis. That was it, Sir John Davis. Uh, and he owned it for a little while. She traveled around the world, Gertrude. She pops up in Egypt. She pops up mm. in Kenya. She enjoyed her final days. Um, and for a while, it, it was owned by him. And then it became a bit of a white elephant. In 1927, Newport Corporation thought, should they buy it? for use of the library and art gallery. Oh, so the link between speaking. Stelvio and the art gallery and the library today is quite strong. Yeah. They put 14,000 pounds aside, but it was seen as too expensive. So it was left and then they eventually got it for 7,000 hmm. pounds. And for a little while, it was a children's home. Oh. But it soon became known as something of a white elephant. It was the county surveyor's office for many years during hmm. World War II. Um, and then it was the DVLA. I don't know. A lot of people watching this will remember Gosh. getting their driver's license uh, uh, sorted out at, at, uh, at this place, at Stelvio. It was mm -hmm. the vehicle licensing department for a, a lot of years before the big move to Swansea. Mm -hmm. Then a firm of accountants took it over. But again, it was in a pretty bad state come the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And there were developments nearby. And so what they decided to do, uh, Newport Corporation, was spot list it. If you spot list a building, that means a third party has pointed out it might be in some danger. And so they literally list it on the spot. Oh, so right. Cadu came along in 1996. In fact, I can tell you the exact date. It was the 20th of March, 1996. They spot listed Stelvio mm. House because it was linked to C.H. Bailey. It was an historical mm. property for Newport with all this mm. history. So that's what they did. The next morning in the early hours, the property developers did this. Oh, my God. The early yes. hours of the next yes. day. Yeah. Now, I try to be dispassionate about these things because there's always mm. two sides. But mm. when you look at the evidence... <laughs> Mm. The defense of McCarthy and Stone was that they weren't told by the council. The council sent a man who valiantly dashed and found that they'd already knocked down the front of it. Yeah. And by that point, the structure wasn't safe enough to save it. And so McCarthy and Stone knocked down the whole of Stelvio House. Oh. Oh, yeah, McCarthy and Stone said they didn't know. 
That yeah. was that they didn't know. The council said you did know. Hmm. Whichever is the truth, it leaves a really bad taste in the mouth, doesn't it? Vince? Yeah. As yeah. you said, Goff, earlier on, this is a very controversial moment in Newport's oh, yeah. architectural history, the destruction of Stelvio. So I won't comment on the rights and wrongs. I'm a romantic when it comes to history anyway, so I'm hmm. not the right person to talk about it. I will merely point out that uh, the court's decision, okay? Okay. March 1998, McCarthy and Stone were found guilty and they were said that they didn't want them to get a profit on what they were building. So they were mm. given the largest fine in the history of the historical building prosecutions. They were fined £200,000 with £13,000 costs. The judge, Tom Crowther, said that the developers were guilty of a cynical commercial act. Good Lord. So we'll let the judge speak yeah. for itself. Yeah, let it float there. There's the building. There's yeah. it after they've had a little pop at it. Yeah. Um, terrible thing. Now, I will say what was built on its site was Monmouth mm. Court, 45 flats, which has actually mm. served, especially the elder community, extremely mm. well. And so, again, uh, it is, uh, it's a worthwhile development. But, mm. again, the destruction of Stelvio, it's mm. a terrible shame. Yeah. There's a lady called Barbara Bowman who put on Facebook that uh, <coughs> the old steps leading up to Stelvio are actually in her back garden. And she very kindly posted them. So there's the oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's called Monmouth Court. Yeah. So we've got the 45 flats, but you still have the old steps. Yeah. Head up to Stelvio House. There you go. Yeah, it's an interesting one, the destruction of Stelvio. Uh but yeah. it's one, whichever way I look at it, doesn't leave a nice taste in the mouth. No, no, no. And it's can't a, it's save a pretty, everything. It's a pretty damning judicial decision, that, isn't it? Yeah, I think yeah. the judge summed it up yeah. the way he saw it at the time. Mm. Um, but life continues. It mm. continued for C.H. Bailey. They're still going. C.H. <laughs> Bailey. It's yeah. still in the Bailey family. I think it's the great grandson who's currently in charge of it. Oh gosh! My grandson of C.H. Yeah. Bailey. But why don't we go? Do you remember we started the Stelvio bit? I showed you that magnificent front in Mill Parade that looked as if it could conquer yeah. the world, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, let's have a look at what it looks like now. Let's go to Mill Parade. Can you see that, Goff? Or maybe? Oh, not. yeah. Yeah, you can still see Mill Parade? Yes. So there we got the transporter bridge, which, of course, yeah. um, that's what Bailey used to fly under, isn't it? That's right, yeah. And here we have the wall of the Tyne Works. Oh, God. still there. But if yeah. you go around yeah. and wander down a little bit further, yeah. you remember that great facade? Oh, yeah. This is it. Oh, <laughs> so we've still got a bit that we used to see. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> a little bit of a wall. Yeah, <laughs> which is a little bit of a shame, but uh, the Bailey Company, C.H. Bailey, continued. They were the first to build dry docks in Malta, and they had uh, works in Newport, Barry, Cardiff, Swansea, Port Talbot, on Merseyside, Bristol, and Malta. I know they've diversified a lot uh, mm -hmm. these days. It is still extraordinary, isn't it, what they managed yeah. to achieve? And you know what brings a little warmth to my heart is when you look. <laughs> At their head office, and you know the address of the head office of this large multinational firm, Alexandra Dock, Newport, C.H. Oh, Bailey God. Limited. Yeah, it goes oh. back to where we started. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, there you go. I guess we won one and we lost one with Whitson and yes, Shelby we did. Yeah, 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 quite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we broke even over the programming. <laughs> yes, we did. And if this video was popular, we're mm. quite happy to do other double yeah. act kind of houses and anthologies in Newport and Cardiff and that area. Mm. But uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. And again, if you have any properties you think might be worth having a look at, drop it on in either in the comments underneath the podcast or, you know, pop it up on our Facebook page or whatever. And we'll uh, leave us a message and we'll see what we can do for you. We'll look into it. And if it's if it's perky, I'm sure Paul will do something nice with it. I certainly will. And by the way, I was described by a friend recently as the world's worst YouTuber, not for anything I've said, I hope, but that's <laughs> up for debate. Um, but because I never ask you anymore 
to subscribe. So if you watch this far, you must have been interested. Do consider subscribing to us so you don't miss a future video. Yeah. If you like the video, it helps. If you share it somewhere, that really helps and we can continue yeah. the conversation. Yeah. So and it's easy to, to subscribe. You just click on our little oh, yeah. dangerous thing in the bottom corner there, our logo, and it'll subscribe you up neatly. Absolutely. So thank you, Goff. That was quite good fun. Ah, very nice. Yeah, very interesting. Really enjoyed that. Yeah, cool one. And we'll be back soon. So thank you for yeah. watching. Good day. Bye. Bye.